we really lost that. Okay, we're good. So welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm Catherine Wygan Fawcett. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Family Owned Business, otherwise known as IFOB. Thank you to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare for sponsoring our program today. And welcome to our remote users. We have over 10 people coming in remotely. So um, thank you to Bill and Russell from Hudson University for hosting us today. In a few minutes, I'm gonna invite Bill to come up and say a few words for us. Um, we'll be recording the first part of this workshop so others may see it as well. And we'll have a short discussion from 10.30 to 11 that we'll not record in case you have some burning questions that you want to ask. And we're also gonna have room for Chris and Mike to be available to speak individually as well. So for those of you who don't know, the IFOB is a nonprofit that helps family businesses succeed. We have over 40 programs this year, and out on the front I have a table, and this is our calendar for the second half of the year. And it also explains our various um, affinity groups that we have. And we, have, we work with women in family business, we work with CEOs, we work with the next generation. And our memberships go from January through to December. So they're prorated, so they're really inexpensive now if you want to join and get involved with us. Um, the uh, out front, I also have um, a brochure that gives you a little bit more information about the Institute. And then I'm also available afterwards if anybody wants to come up and, and speak individually. So you can also check out our website, it's fambusiness.org. And our next program is on Monday, October 15th. It's a family business spotlight, and I have a flyer out there. It's with Sweet Sweetser's Apple Orchard. It's a started in 1812, so it's a, it's the fifth generation with Greg Sweetser. So it's going to be beautiful in the fall in their barn, and we'd love to have you come. It's informal from five to seven. We have great hors d'oeuvres. We'll have some apples. We'll have some some. Uh, beverages, uh, some wine, beer, so it'll be, it'll be a fun event. And then our next educational program is called SPARK. So it's a friendly competition with Maine's business leaders who have sparked transformational growth. The audience will vote on the best idea from those four speakers. And then the, while we're tabulating the results, uh, Steve Tenney, who's here, will be our moderator and we'll have a Q&A. And then the winners of it, it's kind of like a TEDx, the winners of that uh, speaking piece with the best idea will get $1,000 for their favorite charity and the runners up will get $500 to do the same. So it's an opportunity to really learn about how you might transform your business as well. They also get a fabulous trophy that we're hoping to pass on year after year. So. Uh, we're all we're run by a volunteer board, and some of our board members are here. Steve Tenney is here, Paula Mahoney is here, and Patty is here. So thank you. They all work really hard, and they have instituted an IFOB code of conduct, which you can find on our website. So that brings us to today. According to the research by White Horse Advisors, 96% of business owners agree it's important to have an exit strategy. So who has an exit strategy here? Raise your hand. Is it written? Do you have it? <laughs> uh, only 13% have a plan that is current and written. So I didn't see a lot of hands going up. So I'm glad that you all are, you all are here today because there's a 30, 13, and 3% chance that a family business will pass from the first to the fourth generation. So I know we have some three generation, four or five generations here. So it's really important. So it's never too late to start. So I'd like to thank Chris Yonker, who's here, and Mike Dow for joining us today. Chris is an executive coach and a business consultant who tells me he owns a seventh degree black belt in karate. So you never know when that comes in handy working with family businesses. <laughs> so, there you go. And Chris will be talking about making sure companies align their vision and values for the family and employees. And he'll lead us today on this discussion. And Mike Dow here, who runs a 114-year-old family business, it's based on the Big Dig, Logan the Airport, and other major projects. And we had dinner last night, and he's telling me he's working on his retirement plan. He's got a big RV, and he's seeing the country, has grandchildren. 
but they're, um, he's going to be able to really talk to you about his challenges because he's, he's been there. We're, one of our groups that we're working on is in our next gen. Janet Kolkos is here who is, leads our, our next gen programs, which is for the, the younger ones. But we've also started a leaders in transition group for some like Mike who are trying to think what that next chapter is going to be. So um, at the end of the program, we have a special treat. We have three of Chris's books here that we have. I've read it. It's a great quick read. And uh, we'll be giving that away. And as we do that, I always have my survey that we'd love to have you please, please take the time to fill out. Because um, up to now, except for our golf scramble where it got dark and uh, there were a lot of people, we had 86 people there. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, everything has been 100% good to excellent. So this is how we plan our programs going forward. And this is actually our time that we're going to start thinking for next year. So if you have a burning topic or something that, that you'd like us to cover, we'll be working on that. Um, and I would now like to invite Bill to come up and uh, say a few words. Thank, Thank you. you, Catherine. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, Chris, Mike, Aaron, particularly. Good to, good to have you up in, uh, um, in Portland. Uh, just a quick, gosh, uh, you know, looking around, I, uh, I, I have met previously most of uh, all of you, and you've heard me go on and on about Hudson, but we are really in a, in a pretty sweet spot right now. Biggest graduating class last May we've ever had in enrollment for the fall was up to 14.5% uh, of the last fall. Um, you know, it's the largest uh, school of business in the state. Uh, we have produced more MBAs than uh, USM and UNO combined. Uh, but it's more than uh, just a business school. We've got uh, 59 undergraduate degrees, 19 graduate degree programs. So um, it's, uh, it's uh, doing pretty well. And, and we think it's doing pretty well because we uh, have tried to communicate with businesses like all of yours and try to understand what content we need to be bringing into the classroom. And once we figure that out, then we have to say to ourselves, how do we really deliver that to them in a meaningful way? I teach in the School of Business. I'm in charge of Huston's internship program and our corporate partners program, as well as uh, Southern Maine uh, uh, Huston's uh, campus here. So I just want, when I heard about the subject, I asked Catherine, you know, could I just take two minutes and talk about something that, that, that we're doing with companies that might tie into secession planning, uh, high potential identification, and, and that kind of thing. And what that is, is our <clears throat> continuing education programs, workforce development programs. We've got relationships with, I'll mention a few, uh, Jackson Labs, Bangor Savings, Unum, Mimic. We just had a great meeting yesterday with uh, people you, you, people you know in the bank. Uh, but Shimbro, Mike and I chatted about Shimbro. You guys have done a couple of projects with them. But, um, and when I hear back from these companies, why, why they're involved in thinking about continuing education development for people is one, retention recruiting and aside from the fact that they just are improving the quality of their workforce and hopefully helping their business. Now, I know all of you are sitting there saying, well, Bill, that's great, but these the companies you just named are all very large companies. Um, and they all have an employee reimbursement program for education, okay? They do. Um, they're all different. They all do it differently. Some require you to say before you participate in the program, you have to be employed here two years. Some say we're, we're going to pay half of your uh, MBA, but if you leave within two years, you pay it back. So there's several ways to structure this. And if any of you are interested, I put one business card on the table. Just write, get, get my contact information and, and let's chat. I've been involved with every single one of our corporate partners. Uh, in developing their, how they go to their employees with these programs. And let me just give you a specific example. An MBA, our MBA costs uh, about $16,000. It's academically, it's designed to go over two years. There are 12 courses, 36 credits. 
but it doesn't have to be two years. It can be three years. So that 16 can get spread over two is eight, and you, know, you can do the math. Three is less than five. Some companies say to their employee, I'll pay half, you pay half. So that number gets manageable. It does very quickly. So again, if you, and we call that our, our corporate partners program, and there's no reason why, and from Hudson's perspective, why we can't be working with more and more small businesses about designing programs for you around continuing educational development and workforce development. So uh, any questions for me? Again, welcome, and uh, you're gonna have a wonderful, Sure I'm, sure. I'm sure about that. I saw does not fail. I saw Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, so we've got some people. Um, thank you. And by the way, is there this button here that I'm going to hit? Yep. Uh, right, we didn't review that. How's everybody doing? I'm uh, mindfully also paying attention that we're on camera and that folks are be tuning in so that uh, I want to give them so welcome people online welcome people in the room and I want to give everyone an equal experience and I need my first slide up when you're ready okay so um, here's how here's how things are gonna uh, roll over the next uh, six hours you guys have six hours right <laughs> okay so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through um, an outline that will be some discussion in the outline. So um, be prepared to have some discussion at your tables. And in my intention really is, is that we want you all to walk away with something that you can apply. And one of my mentors, he, uh, he really changed my thinking around this idea around learning, right? Like, we go, we go to something and we say we learned information, but what's the context of that word, right? Like, what's it really mean? And he held that word uh, in, in, with a definition of it means behavior change. Think about that. It means behavior change. So when we say we learned something, is it that we have an idea about what we're supposed to do or what we should do or how things should go? Or is it that we're actually changing behavior in order to start generating and moving towards that outcome. And uh, I'll challenge you all with that frame because also the other thing I'll say is that sometimes you might hear some of the things I'm gonna to say today, quite frankly, probably heard before, right? You've probably heard before, maybe you read it before, someone's mentioned it before. But the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, am I supposed to smile? <laughs> um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, you say you know something, the, question, the other question I'd ask you then is, are you, are you living it, right? Like if you say you know it, like, oh, I know I need to eat well. Well, okay, do you, know, I mean, maybe change, look at that, that word too, learn and know and see how that applies to you. And it's, it's kind of a pers personal thing. All right, let's do a slide test. All right, okay. So <clears throat> what we're gonna talk about today is uh, decisions. Decisions, really, all this really is decisions that we navigate, decisions that we make. And the fact of the matter is, is what's underneath our decisions is kind of the critical thing. Our values, and we'll talk about our mindset or a model of the world in relationship to how we make these decisions. And for most of us, this is, uh, I'll call it in, in, in the realm of like unconscious. It's something that we're really not necessarily thinking of. So what I wanna do is start queuing up today is your awareness around and as my, Mike and I, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll interview Mike here in a little while, as we talk about things, really start challenging yourself around how am I looking at things and is it really right through the right frame or not? Is it, is it accurate? Because a lot of these frames are, we, we make them up anyway. So um, if we have a higher level awareness around how we're thinking about things, then uh, I'll say we did a good job. So let's, uh, let's uh, at, start with the first decision. So. Everybody in here has has a business in some some aspect or involved with a business and even if for people quite frankly We could talk about folks that are employees in the company the idea of a transition Meaning that there's going to be some type of change and how involved that change is even for yourself personally Is going to happen for any one of us, right? It's gonna it's gonna happen. 
So the question that this, you know, the decision will have to make is, as far as the frame is, are you going to look at the idea of succession? And so this topic is, is interesting. I've spoken at several conferences around it. And what I found is sometimes people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to go there. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to get into it. And, and I think and you get to you got to look at why is that what's underneath it and, and many times it's like this idea is insurmountable. It's this big thing. Is it something that we can navigate. And so do you want to look at it that way or do you really want to look at it through the lens of like if, if I, you know, could it be possible. Is there a way and what Mike and you know when Mike and I talk about this, you can maybe get some 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 frame on this. Is there a way that if we go through a process. And I'm going to outline a four stage process in particular, but if we go through a process, is there a way that we could get to the other side of this and have the family, if it's a family owned business, assuming so, have uh, each individual in the family, have the key employees and contributors in that business and the customers that you're contributing to and the legacy of all that? Is there, is it possible that actually you could end off in a better place? Because you did it, is you know, is, is that is that possible? And I'm not saying that you don't have to go through difficult challenges on the way, but I want to hold that out as, as a context for you to think about, because uh, you know the fact of the matter is is that, um, and this is a, probably a heavy thing to say, but we're all gonna go at some point, <laughs> right? Everyone's aware of that. Okay, I'm not the first person to tell you. And we don't we don't think about that right necessarily, but uh, I think that having the context of every day is a gift. No one here knows how long they have. I mean that's the reality of it. And what what is it specifically that we're going to do with that? And how are we going to leverage this idea? Like how are we going to leverage the philosophy that you know I'm not, life is going to go on regardless of what I do, right? So. And quite and with and so with that, that leads to one of you know, there's really two areas, and there's a lot of areas within these two. There's two specific primary reasons why uh, succession, the process, the planning, it just doesn't doesn't go as well as it could or should. Okay. And um, the first one, and I'll go into some of these as we go through these four stages, is lack of alignment, the visions. Values, and and there's 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 misalignment there. Folks are coming from different different places, and the second one, I'm going to avoid to say. Uh, the second one is is really that folks are just they don't want to go there, right? They're, they they don't want to. There's something about it. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait, and that happens a bit. And then what happens? Anyone want to guess? Yeah. So it ends up. So think about this, and it's funny because one of the questions that you know um, my partner Justin and I get asked a bit is like, well, how long out should I think about a succession process? And you know, some like, well, you know, a couple of years, or I'm not really ready right now. You talk to people, well, I'm not, you know, I mean, several clients we worked with are five to ten years out. I mean, that to me, that's ideal. These at least three, I mean, because you say, well, why so long? Well, as you get into the process, you'll start seeing why it's why so long. Time goes by quick, right? And what most people do is they wait. And then, and here's what kind of what happens. And I'm not saying that people end up in a place where they, they can't get out of, but think about this idea, a choice, a decision to do something by design or to do it by default, right? That's kind of, you know, it's, if you wait till yeah, you're in a have to situation, then it's going to be default driven, and your choices are not going to be as rel as as powerful as they could have been. And quite frankly, to me, from my experience and what I've seen, because I've seen both sides of this over the years, you're kind of take by by going the default route, you're taking away from the family, from the business, from the employees, and from the customers, typically. So, and with go through the process, you'll see you'll see more. Uh, you're more, more of what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm going to uh, go through these four stages, and with each of the four, um, we're going to talk about them a little bit. I'm going to um, 
give you some perspective. And then um, I'm going to give you all a question at your table. You can discuss around each of these. And then I'll give you an illustration. And then um, after I'm done with going through the four, I'll, I'll bring uh, Mike Dow up. And then uh, we'll, we'll have some conversation through those four stages as well. So you can have something. I, I want you to leave with like an, a, a bit of, a, of, of an anchor of I've got, I've got something here that I can, I can, I can follow. OK. So let's talk about uh, the, first, the, first, the first one here. And this is around um, <clears throat> vision and values, culture. There's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot in, this, in this particular topic. But it starts really with you, with a person, each of you, individually. Whether you're at the helm right now, you're in the family, you're somewhere in the business, each one of us can has the ability to create an outcome that we're looking for holistically. And I think holistically is, is, is a key driver of these four stages. A transition should be much more, first by family succession or a business succession, should be much more than if you're, if you're selling it or pass it on, let's say you're selling it, should be much more than just, you know, from a family member to a family member, however that might look, it's going to be more than like a transaction, if you will, right? Like a, a just a, something you just kind of do. It's, it's, it's thought out. And each person that's in, uh, tied to something, they've got what? Their own thing that they want, right? Like true or not? Does anyone here have a life outside of what they do? <laughs> no? Some of you do? Okay. Um, so, right, like we all have families, things we want to do, experiences we want to create, lives we want to live. Like there's, there's, there's this whole um, thing that we want and we, you know, we, we want to provide. And we want to get those things to be in parallel. And I think the interesting thing is when you look at vision and, and this, this topic is, is, a pretty, is a pretty massive one. I mean, that's part of the reason I've been doing even just workshops on um, several day workshops and, uh, on this, this, this whole idea because you can break your life down into areas, right? And then you can look at your alignment in those areas and you can really get clear on what specific outcomes you want. And this is another area where like, hey, you're gonna do this intentionally or you're just gonna, you know, go by default again. Hey, let's just see what happens, right? You know, let's, let's see what happens if I go this way for so long. And then it's like, are you in a movie and are you producing and directing that movie or really is your life is like someone else is doing the movie and you're just showing up and you're just living it out and it's just a situation comedy ongoingly you don't have <laughs> any any frame of reference right and a lot of people live, live their lives in a way that they don't take enough responsibility that they don't believe that they have enough control and there's a lot of control in a lot of areas that we have that we don't necessarily uh, realize so um, I'm going to Anyone here familiar with Alice in Wonderland? There's some people looking, walking up here going like, why does that guy have a copy of Alice in Wonderland? That's a weird dude. Um, so there's some wisdom in this book. Um, so I'm going to read you a passage. And just listen to, listen to the words here and just think about this for a second. <clears throat> Would you tell me, please, which way I might... Uh, oh, I said, which way... I'm sorry, sorry, again. Would you, please, would you tell me, please which way I ought to go from here. That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added. Oh, you're, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough, right? If you only walk long enough, if you only walk long enough, you'll get somewhere, right? I mean, hey guys, guess what? If you just don't tie any attention to the, re the rest of what you do, then you'll end up somewhere, right? And then unfortunately, and I know that's not for the people in the room, because you guys are sitting in a room uh, tied to the topic, but for a lot of folks, it's like, then you get to blame the circumstance and other people of why you're stuck where you are. Isn't that interesting, right? Because then it doesn't have to be your fault. So accepting responsibility is kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a heavy thing. It's a scary thing to do. So what I, I'd like to do 
is um, I'm going to share, if it's okay, a story from uh, to kind of give you guys a um, reason. And it's kind of pretty personal, but I really want to share this because it allows you to demonstrate the power of creating the vision, what you want, right? And clarity around the vision and how, how that might look. So um, my wife and I have been uh, married for 23 years. Um, been together for 28, quite a while, right? We met um, in uh, third grade. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, she was really cool at recess. Um, so we we never got here. We go look, think about the alignment of values and what you want, right? So, like for a, a bit, so first part of our marriage, we just we weren't on the same page about. We knew we wanted kids, but when we wanted the kids was was the, the thing that we weren't on the same page on, and we just kind of navigated accordingly. And figure, you know, it's one of those things we, you know, quite frankly, we kind of put it off a little bit, right? And it's maybe like a succession situation, <laughs> and and then we realize, like, guess what? You know, you start doing the what? You do the math, right? Like. Ooh, I'm going to be like 90 years old and she's got to go to prom and that's going to be really weird. So I want to be a chaperone and I want to dance with her. Um, anyway, so um, needless to say, uh, we got to a situation, and this was uh, a few years ago, where, now we're we'll back time, let's say six years ago or so, we're like, you know what, it's, it's, it's time, but you know, we got to do something here. So, um, needless to say, um, we, we weren't able to get pregnant. We tried, and we tried. And uh, so we went to um, some specialists, right? We can do some research. We know, hey, we, want, we, want, we try to make this work. How can we make this happen? And we're looking at options. So uh, we went the, the IVF route, right? Invest a bunch of money, and, and you, know, you uh, turn your body into, you know, it's, it's something my wife wanted to do, and I respect it. It's, it is challenging and a lot of pressure. And so we get to the, we're pretty involved in that, and it just doesn't work out, bottom line. So it's just, now we're like, okay, this is, we check this box, and this box is checked. So we knew we, we wanted to um, have a, a child, at least one child. So we're like, all right, well, so we started research on adoption and going and interviewing, you know, and just think about the context of things. You start interviewing people, have experiences, and, you know, not everyone's experience is going to be the same. And quite frankly, I got, you know, a 60, 70% of the things I heard were not all that great. Like, I'm like, oh, boy, this sounds like really exciting. So, you know, you, you get different folks. And I interviewed folks. And so needless to say, I'm like, all right, well, we're going to generate our own outcome here. And um, so my wife likes to capture um, pictures. She's like big time. Okay. Anyone want to hear that uh, related to anyone that way? So she's taking pictures all the time of, of what's going on with Grayson. And uh, which is quite frankly, I'm thankful for because we have a really great, a great library and we share it with family and, and, and keeps us all connected. And her photo library is just, oh, and this, these pictures actually are right, right out of her photo library here um, on our computer. So uh, I wanted, I want to kind of cue you guys up here. Now Grayson is, um, she's a, uh, three and a half, but she would tell you she's three and three quarters. So apparently there's a, a deviation between half and three quarters. Someone mentioned that to her and she wants to own it. And um, so if you look at the top left corner picture, there's something per peculiar about, about that, that photo. Can anyone tell me what it is? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's a good, yeah, that's true. Anything else? Huh? Be a, be like a sleuth. Oh, here's the interesting thing about that photo right there on the left. That's not my daughter. Oh. In fact, um, so my wife, oh, we have vision boards. Now, here's the other layer of interestingness on this. My wife captured this photo on her phone on November 4th, 2013. Grayson was born on November 4th, 2014. So a year after she captures this photo and puts it in her phone, Grayson's born. And then on the 19th of that month, we got a phone call from the adoption agency, which happens to be Julie's birthday. 
it's all coincidences, I know. So, but I don't believe in just coincidences. Things happen intentionally. And I, I share this because I think it presents the power of possibility, right? In fact, our adoption process was like, it was easy, honestly. I can go more into it, I'm not going to, but it was, it was easy, it was effortless, it was enjoyable, and it was a gift, and it was awesome. But, I mean, and here's the other, other thing that's, that's a kind of, kind, of, kind of interesting perspective. When um, I was with Jolie uh, at some point, and I, I, I forgot about this photo. It was in her office it was in, on, a, on a poster board. This, like, this is like, I'm guessing, like a year and a half, two years ago. I'm looking at, I'm looking through, she's, so, she's always like, look at this. And I'm like, Grayson at that time didn't want to go in the water. And I'm like, how'd you get her in the water? And I, I thought it was my own daughter. <laughs> I swear to God. Because like the hairline, the, the, the eyebrow, it's like, it's a splitting image if you saw her from a side profile. So, all right. So let's, uh, let's talk about alignment here. <clears throat> so you've got, think of the, fa uh, this is why family succession is a little more complicated. If you've got family, you've got business, and you've got individuals. And if you really want to take a holistic approach, we've got to look at like all three. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm missing one item on, on these circles. I just noticed this last night. So let's kind of walk through each of these a little bit. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to give you guys uh, an exercise. And then we'll kind of circle back. <clears throat> the, um, the first one is, is like, uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about vision. Right, vision. Vision is the outcome that you want to create. It's the future perfect for you, right? Holistically. How do you, you know, when I'm, I'm working with folks, um, I mean, I've got some in my best seller, best selling authors I'm coaching, and like, I'm trying to understand like, what's their ideal outcome? It's not generating a lot of money, but like, what, how, many, how many hours do you really want to work? What you want to look life to look like? We got to architect this thing, right? We're not just going to. And this is, you know, it's really, in fact, when Justin and I meet with, with folks and we ask them, what do you want to do with the business? Some people are like, hey, I'm at 35 million. I don't want to get to 50 million. And that answer is totally cool and relevant. It, it's, it's a personal thing, right? And, and, there, and it may, because maybe it's because like, well, you know, more is not always better, right? More is not always better. Or, you know, or I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to have the business own me. For a lot of folks that create a business and get it to, you know, a, a multi seven figure, a multiple seven figure business, what ends up happening is they don't take their self out of the business enough and, and then they end up having to carry something and it becomes a burden. And then that burden, you know, they love it, but they despise it at the same time. That's a challenge. So what's, what is it, the, what's the ideal outcome for yourself personally and professionally? I would want both those answers because I want to make sure that we get to that outcome. Because if we set you up and help you start moving a certain down a certain path with your business or someone else in that business and they don't want that, and I'll talk about this in illustration later on, it's going to create an issue. So the other thing is, I'll say about vision is you want alignment from, uh, well, I'll get, let's go talk through each one. So, so that's vision. The second one is core values. A core value is like, it's something that you hold sacred for you, and that is really important to you, that you're not willing to go off center on. And what happens is, if someone puts you in a situation in your company, where you work, with your family, whatever it is, that you're compromising your core values, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have resistance, you're gonna have stress, you're gonna have issues. Even if you're, not, even if you're participating, you're gonna have issues. So we want to make sure we have clarity in what these are so we can align them and get them lined up. And the third one that's missing from here uh, that I put up here is purpose, is purpose. Purpose is tied to your why. Why are you doing this? It's really important because purpose is where fulfillment comes from. If you want fulfillment from what you do, you need to align your purpose to it. If you don't, you're not going to be fulfilled. Happiness is something that's, you get happy, you have an outcome. It's like, you know, if you ever had like a record year and you're like really happy about it, but two years later, do you care? Right? Like that happiness, that energy you got from it, that serotonin that kicked in, it's not, it's not the same, right? It's just not. So 
fulfillment is like a, this long-term perpetuating thing that can happen if we align what it is that our purpose is. Now, the ideal is, is that you want to get alignment of these three things targeted to be in parallel. <coughs> if someone says, you know, I want to, I want to uh, become the CEO of, or of this certain big company, and, and let's, let's take it out of the family context, and and I want to, I'm going to, you know, to do that trajectory, I got to move here, here, and here, and you're going to be relocatable, and, um, but then I can make all this money and, and work out a corporate, which is over here, and then the spouse says, well, okay, and so that's their vision, they lay it all out, and the spouse's vision is like, I want to stay by family, within, within 30 minutes, my parents, and my brothers and sisters, and I, my core value is time with family, my love language is quality time. You see an issue, right? This stuff happens all the time. And this is what starts creating the issues in relationships. And this happens in businesses too. You pull someone into a business and then, you know, are, is, there, is there alignment? So I'm gonna give you guys uh, an exercise. So I'm gonna give you like five minutes or so, watch the time, I'll watch the time. And um, here's the exercise. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have discussion at your table. If you don't want to talk, it's going to be really weird. Okay. So, um, um, and what I'm going to give you, so, I'm going to give you uh, a couple questions to banter on. Okay. And this is just for discussion purposes, and we and we can pull we can pull back anything anyone wants to share. You don't feel have to feel obligated to do so. So what I want you to, what, there's two things I really want you to talk about in, in general. One is I want you to talk about the vision of the business you're part of. The vision. Where are you guys going? What are you trying to do? We're just trying to survive. Okay, well, that's your baby, that's your vision. I challenge you on that one, but that's fine. And then, um, what's your personal vision? What's your personal vision? What is that? What's that? What's that? You know, what, what is it that you're looking to generate? And then, if we, if time presents, you know, we can look, and you know, if, if nothing else, you can look at the other question I'd ask you for later. I'll maybe give you some things to think about when, you know, when you leave here. Business vision, personal vision. Where am I aligned and where am I conflicted? Where am I aligned and where am I conflicted? Got the three questions? Personal vision, business vision. Where am I aligned and where am I conflicted? Okay, cool. All right. You got about five. Okay. <laughs> Right, right. 
Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Start wrapping up. Two minutes. Yeah. 
All right, time to bring it back. Time to bring it back. Okay, I know there's probably more to try to pat on, but we got a room. We got, we got it. All right, I was up here. Let's go. Okay, so we got four stages to cover. We're not, I mean, we're, for the sake of time, uh, you know, we could workshop this thing for, for a week if we wanted to. Um, a lot of great stuff here. Does anyone have anything interesting they want to share? Don't have to. We can have time to do that later as well. Okay. Was that, just, yeah, go ahead. I find, the, and I think I heard it from others, that the development of personal vision is in many ways harder. Yeah. Because we're just, you're, you're reacting with kids and you're just going yeah. through life. And right. It's easier to have a business plan. But the yeah. personal side is tough and therefore you don't know if it's aligned. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and do you hear the term he used? He said, uh, going through life. Right, so that goes back to that conscious perspective, right? We unconsciously or consciously going through life, right? Because life's going to happen, right? But are we going to do it intentionally, or are we not? Right, like so. One of the things that uh, for Justin and I, who work together, one of the things that we really value time uh, around our families and creating space in our lives, and we've built our businesses in a way that allow that to happen. And there's rules associated with, you know, um, that, that type of thing, right? Even in my personal, in my personal business, business vision, it actually stipulates that I will only do so many speaking engagements a year and how much travel I'm willing to do and that they're consciously selected. We don't, we don't react to those and we're intentional behind the process which is tied to my personal vision about how much time I spend with my family, which is also written that way. So it's, I think part of the challenge guys, as we get into this next stage, and you'll see why this is stage two coming up here is that our frame of reference is key. If we don't think we have control of this stuff, you ain't going to do anything about it. Right? So very good. Thank you very much. There's one more other hand over here. Yeah. So I just wanted to touch on vision boards yeah. for a minute. Sure. Um, so I definitely am totally sucked into my business, both on my personal side and the business world. Um, um, but I made a vision board about six years ago. Oftentimes it's under a pile of laundry. Um, <laughs> decide if that's clean or dirty. Yeah. Um, or you know, it's, it's it's thrown in a spot. Yeah. I pulled it out the other day, and I built it primarily around my personal life because I had trouble envisioning. What I wanted. I'm just now in the empty nest phase. Okay. Um, uh, and the business is 25 years old. And I'm taking things off my vision board that, even though it was under a pile of laundry, tucked in the way back, dusty, these are things that have happened. Yeah. Like right down to the beach hat yeah. that I saw in a magazine six years ago that I picked up at CBS and Wells last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So vision boards are incredibly powerful. Yeah. They lurk somewhere in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, they're great, that's a great share. Um, I have a, a board that we do every year. I suggest to do them with your family. Do them with your family, what experiences you want to create, things you want to do as a family. Um, and then I also, uh, in, in our workshop, uh, Wings, we, we build is, uh, we have a, a four stage process there in regards to the vision. Uh, but each department broke it down into 12 and I have actually I have a book that I carry with uh, Not today. I shouldn't say I carry it um, But I should have brought it um, and it's got um, And if you want an outline of one just uh, Ask me at the end or whatever. And I'll, 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 I'll I can get your information. I'll send it to you um, But bottom line is it's uh, it's like a hundred pages long It's got pictures of it and it's it pictures in it and everything else But it's extremely powerful and it took me a lot of time to put this thing together. You say why would you do that? I don't know, I guess I'm going to live the rest of my life and I thought I would do it intentionally, you know? I just don't, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not into the default scenario. I just, it's not my movie. So great. Good, good share. Um, let's, let's move into, uh, I got one story real quick on stage one. I'll share with you real quick. Uh, so I, a client I worked with 
I was brought in and they, uh, they're going from I think Gen 2 to, two to 3. That's, that's a critical thing. But they, they did, uh, the, the guy had built many, that, taken that business to another level and then he added a few other businesses in the fold. So they owned, they owned, the family owned several different businesses and he had uh, three kids, uh, a daughter, two sons. And basically the situation was, is that a lot of kind of how things happened and who owned what part of what business and what role they had in what company, it wasn't really well thought out. It was a bit of a hot mess, quite frankly. And, and you guys probably won't believe this part, but he had some dysfunction in his family. Yeah, yeah, I know not yours. Um, so what happens typically with, with some of these, these, these uh, with business is like you have the dysfunction of the family and some of that goes into the business, which is joyful. And then the business has its own dysfunction potentially and then in culture and, and so it creates challenges. Needless to say, we got to this vision creation piece, right? So when I, uh, when, when I, if I work with folks, what I think I, I really want to do and my number one objective is to help each per the, the key members, the, the stakeholders in that business, I want to help them create personal visions. And I want to, I want to, it doesn't have to be a big book, but I, I want an idea where they want to go, where their values are, all, all this. Because here's, here's what happened. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, six weeks in the project and I find out that one of the owners, the next generation, I asked her really, what, you know, what does she really want to do? What's her purpose? What's it tied to? And um, they were, um, they're in a, I'll say the product, product business. I'm not going to go into it because you guys would know who they are because they're from Maine. It's a very big business. And, um, and needless to say, she was, uh, she was getting paid six figures to work part-time in the business and really wasn't getting, you know, quite frankly, the, what she was doing, you would never pay someone that, for that kind of role. So she felt guilty about it, but they could you know, afford to do it. And, but the real issue is, is that in her heart of hearts, she wanted to be a nurse. Okay. There's no medical or anything tied to anything here. I said, whoa, you know, and she's, I put her mid thirties. I said, okay, well, we should probably make that happen. And she said, I know. I said, what's, what's the problem? I don't, I don't want to tell my dad and my brothers, you know, cause I think they're probably, you know, there's an expectation here. I said, you got to sit down and talk to them. So she did. And guess what? They were like, well, we should make that happen. Like, they're like, well, I wouldn't know that. It was a very, it was a pretty emotional uh, uh, meeting. But needless to say, um, so we moved on, the transition, uh, it was a six month project and uh, a couple of years go past. And I get this email in my inbox. I'm like, oh, what's, what's this? And it's from this person's name and whatever. And I didn't connect it at all. And I, right away, I see this big picture load uh, on my desktop and it was this lady smiling uh, in a nurse's outfit and she wanted to thank me and she actually was just got back from uh, like a third world country where she did some volunteering and she's just saying how, how meaningful her life was. So that's that's the kind of stuff that uh, could come out come out of, of diving into diving into this stuff. I'm trying to change it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I pointed my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, let's go into stage two. And uh, stage two, uh, oof, this is my favorite one, and I wish uh, we had more time to cover it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give you give you the the, the uh, main points that you really should probably walk away with. I call stage two finding reality. Because reality in itself is kind of an illusion. And we're going to uh, take a potty break in about 15 minutes. Um, so here, here's, here's, we, we want to pr protect the, the family, right? We want to protect the business, the individuals. We want to map this thing in. And each person brings their model of the world to their situation. Model of the world. Now, when I say model of the world, these are your beliefs, your paradigms, what the context that you hold around everything, around everything. 
Now, how much of what we believe is based upon truth? What do you think? Oh, 100%. Yeah. So, because someone could say, well, um, you've got to work out a lot to be fit. Health and wellness is an easy one to use. Uh, you've got to, uh, you've really got to watch what you eat and only eat certain things if you want to maintain an ideal weight. Those are paradigms. Are they based on truth? No, they're not based on truth. Because if it was true, it would be true 100% of the time. Truth is based 100% of the time. And oftentimes we create stories around what's true and then we live that out and we don't realize that maybe you could be wrong. There might be something else. Let me talk about a little bit how that works. Um, in 1934, um, this guy named Thurman Fleet was like one of the first, he's a, um, a, like a psychi psychologist. Uh, he, he was one of the first to kind of architect this, this, this diagram and this idea behind the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and, and, and illustrate this. So imagine this is a person. This is kind of how you tell, okay, to get, to get the similarity. Um, with half a head. And the reason they have a half a head is because the zero, age of zero to seven, so where my daughter is right now, her subconscious mind is an open well, a fishbowl, if you will, to whatever wants to go in. She asks a lot of really interesting questions, and I, I love taking her to, to school in the morning, and we're chatting, and she's like, just asking some really interesting, interesting things about just about life, and you know what our animals. The other day, she asked me, "Are animals in heaven too?" And just you know, she's so she's building her belief system, right? And I, fortunately for us, I'm aware that we're influencing it pretty heavy duty. So we, I really, I do, we, 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 my wife and I challenge each other about what we say about like in our house, we don't, one of the things we won't talk about is having a bad day because I don't want to program that idea. I'm not saying all days are awesome, but I don't want to program the idea of like, because if she owns that, like right off that this happens, it's a bad day. And think about it by, by 10 o'clock in the morning, she's already decided how the rest of her day is going to be. I don't want her to have that context. So uh, are we consciously, I'm not saying she won't get it somewhere else, but she's not going to get it from our house, right? So these are things that you know, we've, we've talked through. So our subconscious mind gets programmed by age of seven. And the challenge with it, though, guys, is that you don't have the ability to reason at age three, age four. You can't go, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true because, you know, you just you don't argue it, <laughs> right? Seriously, right? So it just kind of goes in and then it's, it's there and then it becomes, you know, we'll call it your own truth, if you will, to some degree. Um, so, and then the conscious mind comes in seven plus somewhere thereabouts. So the conscious mind is where you reason. It's where, it's where you can, you have the ability to kind of to look at things and think them through. The issue, here's the issue though, and this is a, you get one thing from this diagram, this is probably the, the key takeaway. As human beings, we take in our experience through our senses. Can't argue that, right? Your visual cues, your auditory, your kinesthetic, your taste. You're just taking in the world, right? And the brain, this is, this is uh, documented, the brain is a massive filtering mechanism. You can only take in five to seven bits of information at a given point in time. You really can only focus on one thing at a time. But you can batch between the two. Women are better at going back and forth than guys are at processing. Okay. But the, the, here's the thing. You're getting zero to seven, five to seven bits of information at a time. Your brain is literally filtering out almost everything that's not aligned with what's in your subconscious mind. Meaning that if you believe something, think about what you believe. If you believe something, you have a paradigm. If something negates that paradigm, in most cases, you will totally not even see it. 
even if it's got it demonstrates a level of of argument against what you think and believe. So that's this is why this stuff's pretty scary, because we're going to live our world out according to that. So I'm going to we're going to uh, take ten minutes. We're going to do another discussion uh, in this stage, and then uh, ask also if you need to take a quick potty break. So I'll make sure it's I'll give it yeah, 10, 12, maybe 10, 12 minutes. What I want you to do in the exercise is, is this. I want you to, and this is the question you want, I want to write down and think about, is as I'm looking to my transition, now that goes back to your vision, what we did earlier, your transition, of where, where you want to go, be with your business, maybe if you're part of your role in that business and where you want to do the, your personal transition, it could be on the business or on yourself within it. I want, I want you to discuss, um, where specifically are you stuck or you think you might get stuck? Where are you stuck or where might you get stuck around your transition personally within your business or for the business in itself? Does that make sense? Question clear? Okay, where are you or where might you get stuck? Okay. So you have to think ahead, like, well, what could happen? Like, where can I get stuck if you're not, you don't think you're stuck right now? But no one really raised their hand at the beginning that said they have an exit plan, so maybe you're stuck. <laughs> I don't know. It's just a guess. So uh, take about uh, seven, ten minutes, and we'll, we'll come back. <laughs> this is good? Yeah. 
All right, it's time. Here we go. Two minutes are up. Hey. You need to take a bathroom? Yeah, just All right. <laughs> Two minute bathroom break. Two minute bathroom break. Do the body now. <laughs> Start at 9 50. You need to use the restroom, use it now. We're going to keep rolling. Use the rest of now. Remember this one. Too much to cover. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't know that. 
Okay. All right. Here we go. We're going to talk about something you guys are going to love. So I don't want you to miss it. Um, so you're going, to, you're going to love this. All right. So here's the, uh, here's the question. Why? Why do we, you know, I was talking to someone at the table here and we're talking about the thing that was, you know, what were the question that I had asked, right? About, you know, really what I asked you guys is what's your story? What's your story? That's the question I asked you. Because we have a story about our condition and our situation. And the story is allows us to carry on, allows us to hold it, allows us to keep things the same because it's a good story. And in fact, the more logical the story, the better off it is. And typically we'll tell other people who will buy our story, support our story. We don't like, typically we don't like to talk to people who challenge our story because then that would cause us to have to Change our story. Ooh. So why do we avoid this? Why? Like, let's get to the, the reason behind it. What's under the surface? Things we don't want to deal with. Right. Things we don't want to deal with because fear. Fear. Ha ha. There are two primary motivators for human beings. Just two. Everything falls in these two categories. What are they? Unknown. That's an in one of them. Pain and pleasure. Those are the two. Everything's either one of those two things. You want to pursue it because it sounds good, feels good, looks good. See, I'm contexting that all to sensory cues, by the way. Or, I don't want to go there. That's not going to be good. I'll avoid it. We don't say that, though. We just make stories about it. So this all happens at, under the surface. And this is part of the reason that, you know, um, I kind of, you know, it's like the secret sauce of where I love to work. is because if I can't remove this stuff for somebody, 
they, they're going to be an override. Imagine like putting your brake, parking brake on your car and just like, well, you know, one time I was riding around my grandmother and uh, <laughs> we were out shopping. She's, she'd love to chat. We'd have great conversations in the car. A very, uh, very outgoing person and not very organized, but very outgoing. And um, we got back to the house one day to their house and, and I'm like, What's that smell? And uh, she had left the emergency brake on just a little bit, not all the way, just enough to, you know. She drove, we drove a little while, while for that on it, but she, she's probably wondering why she had to fly so much gas. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the RPMs were so high. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's an interesting illustration, right? We have this thing going on and then we're avoiding it. And so let me give you one other case in point about this. Uh, and I, I'm gonna move into stage three. Um, so, I had a, uh, this is why this is so important. I had a, uh, a client who built a family business, um, very good sized company over the years. And he got, um, he had worked, he was trying to create some type of transition, get like, at least get the transition started, get a little bit out of the business. And he couldn't, he kept, he was stuck, he was stuck, he was stuck. And so he'd hire a coach, hire a coach, work called Sultan, and, and I was like number, I don't know, who knows what. But I was going to talk to some of the people, you know, his, his wife, other people were like, next, next, you know, here comes another guy who's going to help this, help him. And, um, and I asked him, one of the things I asked him about his vision, what he wanted to create in his life, and he said one of the most important things he wanted to create was peace. Peace. He wanted peace. Because he didn't have it. And the reason he didn't have peace is because his emergency brake was on and he was, ride, he was overriding it. And... And so the fact of the matter is, is that he had a paradigm, a belief that I found that said, in order to have success, I must struggle. And so he owned that. And then what would happen is we would start, uh, move, and we would get into stage three. We were working on stage three as well at that time. And things would be going kind of better and good in the business and a little bit in his life. And then he'd make, he'd, he'd get involved and then he'd, and he'd, he'd sabotage, screw things up, or make it more complicated. Because it was going too easy, and he had a struggle. And so I kind of got to a point with this guy, and I'm like, well, what if you had success, and you didn't have to struggle? He said, I wouldn't know how to do that. I mean, it's truth. He said, I wouldn't know how to do that. And I said, well, we're going to have to figure that out. Because unless I could change that and lock that in him, he was never, never going to have peace. And eventually we did, which was awesome. And um, we, you know, we were able to move someone else into the, the CEO role, and, and uh, they're, they're doing actually amazing right now. So that's, that's the key. Uh, that's an illustration of, of what can happen. All right, so I'm back on the slides. OK, so stage, stage, number, stage number three, OK? Stage number three. Um, I'm going to call this one uh, up level. Up level. Here we go. Okay, so now we're starting to un unlock things with the folks involved, got vision, values, core values, all that kind of laid out purpose. And stage three is about up leveling. No matter what, in regards to any transition, you want to look at what's going on within the business and you want to up level it. You want to up level it. Doesn't mean you have to make the business bigger. But the, you got to think through, like when we get to stage four and when we're talking about the actual transition, that founder, that family, whoever it is, they're integrated into the business. I'm going to interview Mike here in a few minutes. And, and what you, you're going to find is, is that, that you, you got to pull, you got to pull that person out, right? Like they got to be pulled out. They got to become insignificant. One of the things that I did with this, this client that I was just mentioned in the past story is we got to a place from like, hey, when's the longest vacation you've taken? And he's going or whatever. I said, I want you to take a month. And just be gone. I want you to be irrelevant in your business. Like we set this as a goal. It took us about a year to get there. And um, it was tough. It was challenging for him. But I had to create an experience for him in the business that it could, it could thrive and work without it. Because without it, what's going to happen? And you get into other issues too. They're like, well, who am I going to be and what am I going to do? You know, and, and, and that's, that's the other challenge. But um, so we want, we want to get involved 
and and now reason we 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 hand we, we go about this one is like hey we want to figure out what's the process how we're doing things really like what's the strategic plan like where's the vision of the business and then how are we strategically going to get there and then operationally how are we going to carry that out and then what are we going to focus on and track on a regular basis tied to these things to assure we're getting aligned behavior to ensure outcome. Okay. And, um, and this quite frankly is a, a big reason. This is part of the reason that uh, Justin and I are collaborating together because this is his, this is uh, my strong suit stage two. His, this is his strong suit. He lives here. He, he can see right how to map, map something to a business and, and when, when you get through stage one and two, uh, it just, it's natural, natural for him. So I'm going to give you guys some questions to consider in this stage. The other part of this stage that I, I want to point out is, is health and culture. So I'm going to, um, for sake of time, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a book reference. Um, so uh, here is, uh, here's the book. Um, the book is, um, it's really two. The author's name is, uh, write it down, Patrick Lencioni. And um, I'm going to recommend The Advantage. If not that, the five dysfunctions of a team, which is actually in the advantage, but the five dysfunctions of a team is actually uh, a parable. So it's kind of a story. Some people like a story, get the five dysfunctions. If you really want more about the textbook and then how to take it beyond that, get the advantage. And I, I utilize, you know, our process, we, we utilize Lencioni's model in our work because just get these few key, keys here. If I don't have trust and I can't be vulnerable with my family or my peers, then I cannot get to a place where I'm creating conflict with them and challenging on where we're at, where we're going, what's going on, which then also means I won't get commitments because then I can't have accountability. So if I can't, so with as my work, with reasons that we work with people one on one as far as well as collective, I know when I started working with Mike, you know we worked one on one and collective, and now it's just collective. But it was both because I had to find out each family member's paradigms, perspective, the the, the paradigms of the family. There's a paradigm of the family. They have a paradigm of the family. They have paradigms individually. They have a paradigm as a business. I had to figure out, because this is the river rock that holds the river in uh, on its course. And if we want to change, if you want to change in an organization, you have to change the environment and the culture as well. If you don't, the environment and the culture will always pull it back. Always. So this is why I said this is a holistic model. This piece is critical. Strategic plan, operational plan. It's the questions I'm, I would ask you if we're doing a workshop. I'm gonna give them to you now. We're not gonna do them because we're gonna continue up, continue on. Here are the questions you need to write down. What is, and then this will be a good one for you guys to bring back to work. And for those of you online, I'm gonna point out something real quick here. Um, if you want like, some of the notes of stuff here, a book or whatever, just email my office. Uh, you can just email me, chris at chrisyonker.com. Um, just email some, we'll, we'll send, I'll have uh, Aaron, who's here, send it to you. Um, so, um, I just lost my train of thought. Did you find it? It was over here. Oh, the questions. See, you guys are good. You're paying attention. Whew. Thank God. I might've just gone on to the next stage. All right. Okay. So here are the questions. Um, the questions I want you to consider are, what is our number one priority for the rest of 2018 as a business? What's our number one priority? Second question. What's our number one priority in 2019? Now, one of the questions that we ask folks when we start working with an organization, we do a, a pretty deep, deep dive on discovery. One of the questions we love to ask 
is what's most important right now? Go around an organization, ask what's most important right now in the business? What's most important in the business? How often do you think you get the same answer? Not very often. <laughs> do you think that might be a problem? So you got someone rowing this way, someone rowing this way, wondering why the boat's going in circles. Um, so that's, that's an interesting one, right? So um, can't, you can't over, over communicate what, what's critical and important, you can't. Okay, so I'm gonna move, um, do I have uh, any illustrations I wanna give you? I already gave you one on that one, so let's, as far as, uh, I'm not gonna give you, I'm gonna, when my mic comes up here, we'll talk more about illustrations on that one. Okay, stage number four. Transition. So I'll share a, um, I'll share a story on this, and then I'm going to bring I'm going to bring Mike up, and we'll 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 do an interview. In in a in the role of a transition, um, what we're looking to do is is mindfully navigate this transition to help. Let's say it's a founder, the founder move to their next chapter in their lives. The business as well, and then you know, typically, the the core value of a business, almost always actually, the core value and the core purpose of a business is tied to the founder. By the way, you can chase it all the way back to three generations, four generations. That doesn't go away. That's why it's important to make sure you understand it, and it's owned by the people now operating the business. You want to look at all the places that that person's touching. So uh, I'll give you a quick illustration. Um, Justin and I have a project right now with a guy who owns a very good sized medical practice. And um, he, his, he's got a like, he wants to leave a legacy in his industry and what he does. He could sell his business. He could just go ahead and put it on the market and sell it for good money and be fine. It's not a, it's not a money issue. But he cares about his employees a lot. He cares about his customers, and he really cares about his industry, and he cares about why he's in business and his core purpose, and he wants that to perpetuate. So he's got an interesting challenge, dilemma. And he came into us on, a, on, a, on a, someone uh, introduced us that we we're working with and said, "Hey, this," because uh, he was stuck. I mean, big time, and because he couldn't really see how he could make this happen. So, um, long story short, we've been working with him now for for a little while, and we're we're still in this this this. These stages, but as we're up leveling his business, <laughs> he's like having the best business year he's ever had in his, his history of his business for uh, 25, 30 years, something like that, right, Justin? Yeah, so 25, 30 years. So the uh, which is pr pretty awesome. But what we're doing is we've created space and an understanding of we're going to find the right person. Think of the vision board idea, right? The clarity and what we want. We've got the value alignment the core purpose alignment, the vision alignment to the business that he can bring in with us that we he mentors and trains over a couple years and that the business can transition to. And so we're in the process of that. And, you know, so think about, like, the, it, it, things can look different ways. That's kind of why I bring up the illustration. It, it can look, it doesn't have to, you know, I think the problem we get into is, like, we get so centered on how it has to happen and at the beginning, right? And you can't, can't start there. You don't, the, how is not important at the beginning. What do you want, right? What do people want? What's 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 critical in the, the transition? So um, I'm going to do is, can you come up here? I'm going to bring up uh, Mr. Mike Dow here from uh, the Dow Company. That's the URL. If you want to <laughs> hire them, uh, just kidding. Uh, you want to sit down? You don't? You want to stand? Let's sit down. Come on. Let's have a let's have let's let's have a drink. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, I'm gonna uh, I'm just gonna walk you through some questions. I'm gonna have them here so that we can follow the same thing here. Okay. So why don't you start with um, give them a little bit about your business, what you guys do, how you got in business, and and some background. All right. And if he needs a mic, let me know. We'll, we'll <laughs> <Good> mic him. <laughs> Um, yep, yeah, we're a, a heavy construction, the Dow Company is a heavy construction business. We were started in 1904 by my great-grandfather. At that time, he uh, hauled gravel and uh, lumber by horse and team. Uh, 
They developed into doing cellar holes and sewer lines and things of that nature in the local area. Uh, we've grown now into some big toys. We, uh, the big boys, we like uh, bulldozers and excavators and big trucks, loaders. So uh, it's, uh, the company has grown from his humble beginnings. And uh, just kind of some of the things, the transitions we've gone through uh, back in the 60s, uh, when my father was running the business, and my mother also, uh, and it was out of the basement of our, our my mother's, my father's house, uh, we got into the federal highway program. Uh, we did a lot of the piping on uh, drainage, water, sewer, electrical work uh, on Route 93, 95, 495, some of the highways that you travel. So we did a lot of the piping in that area. Uh, and we also did with the general, we were a subcontractor, we did a lot with general, with our general contractors on local streets and things of that nature. So uh, we were pretty much piping specialists. And then uh, work kind of get slow and our general contractors wanted to uh, keep that work for themselves because they wanted to keep their own people busy. And my father was kind of between a rock and a hard place, needed work, and uh, uh, we actually bought a lot of work to keep our people busy at very cheap prices. And we had some a lot of financial difficulties. Uh, my father passed away and my brother and I took over with my mother and we decided we didn't want to, we wanted to change our business model and not get out of the subcontracting business, but also get into general contracting where we could kind of name our own price. So even though the prices weren't good, at least we weren't giving more to the general contractor. So we get involved in that. We did road work, sewer work, things of that nature. Um, and that uh, worked out pretty well. We got into, uh, by chance, we got into uh, a lot of the work with the big dig. We did a lot of utilities because we were really utility specialists. So we did a lot of uh, utilities uh, for that area, uh, which was very interesting work. It was, we, we got an education that we will never see again, different methods of, of doing things and supporting of excavation. Uh, an example of some of the challenges, we uh, had to put a sewer line about 12 foot deep along South Station in Boston. The first day we dug down to start that line, uh, we discovered that there was a six foot diameter sewer line, brick sewer line, that was about five foot over from where they had expected to it. We spent the next almost four months just digging test holes and finding a route for that sewer line uh, down alongside. And it was about 800 <coughs> feet. It was from, you know, about twice the distance from here to the road. And we spent, uh, that whole sewer line was almost uh, six months in, in the, so it was a great education. We learned how to do, when we had some experience before, we learned how to do work in Boston and all kinds of utilities and all kinds of problems, traffic, those. And uh, so that, that was a great thing. And then the big dig ended and things slowed down again. And so we were bidding sewer work and, uh, and uh, road work again. And we ended up in a position where there were 15, 20 bidders on a project. So if you got a project, they didn't want it because the only guy that got it was the guy that made the biggest mistake. So it, was, <laughs> it wasn't the place we wanted to be in. So fortunately, we had done some, some building work, uh, site work for some of the smaller general contractors. And uh, I might say uh, the, the big dig also introduced us to Logan Airport, going back a little bit. Uh, we did a lot of the work in, in Logan Airport because there were interchanges and roads came in off of the big dig you're probably familiar with. So we probably did, we relocated about 90% of the utilities during the big dig in the Logan Airport area. We got a very good relationship with those people. Uh, so when things slowed down, we ended up with 15, 20 bidders on a thing. We said, well, we want, need to get into another area. So we moved into uh, site work for some of the larger general contractors. And one of the big breaks we had was, uh, it was a job at Logan Airport 
with a large one of the largest general contractors, building contractors in the area, who had a very bad reputation. And we had avoided working with them for years. We just wouldn't work with them. Well, they wanted our expertise in Logan Airport, and they kind of courted us, and we got involved in that and said, at least on that job, we have a chance to, if they, there is a problem with the contractor, then we have a chance to, uh, to have some help from the airport in collecting money or solving problems or anything like that. And as it turned out, that was one of the best jobs we ever had. And we continue to work with that general contractor. We've probably done 12 or 15 projects with them. They've been great to work with. We do a lot of work with that. So we pretty much do everything from the ground down. We do excavation, we do utilities, we do, uh, when they drive piles, we often have to dig 20 feet down in the, in the water to make sure there's no granite blocks or things in the way of that. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting work. We build the roadways, we, do, uh, we don't do landscaping ourselves, but we prepare and we have people that do our landscaping for us and paving and things like that. So. Uh, <coughs> We've really made a lot of transitions through the markets. Uh, we presently have, we're, we're run by my brother and I uh, have been in the business. He's, I'm 70, he's 67. Uh, we have three sons ranging in age from uh, <coughs> 38 to 50 who have been in the business. And uh, we have about a, approximately, it's up and down, but approximately 100 employees running probably uh, about uh, 12 to 15 operations in various places from small jobs, uh, mostly in Boston area, Worcester, uh, that type of thing. So uh, we've kind of gone from the, grown quite a bit, not as fast as uh, my sons want to grow, a little faster than my brother and I wanted to grow, but we've kind of <laughs> kept a, a steady, we kind of balance each other and kept a steady growth. So. Uh, what would you say are some of the core values for your family and for your business? Like, what would you? Uh, for the business, uh, we work very hard at building our reputation yeah. for on-time work, for uh, quality work, and something that's kind of uh, not everybody does. We work with the general contractors and owners to make their jobs go better. We had a job in Worcester where we. One of the first things we did on the job was there was a lot of dirty dirt, contaminated material. And we saved the owner, we suggested to them, to the contractor and owner, that we not take that material off site, but take it into another place and build a sports field with it. It saved the owner a million dollars. So that's the type of thing that we, and we saved a little bit in trucking and things like that. So it was good all around. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do that's a little bit different from everybody else. How have you guys navigated in regards to figuring out, you know, you've got you're, the, the three boys that are involved in the business. How do you decide who's involved and who's not involved, right? What's the expect, we were talking about this, I was with these guys yesterday, actually. Um, and we were talking about the next, you know, the next generation beyond the one, you know, that we just passed on to. And, you know, how do you decide, like, who's, who's going to be involved, who's not going to be involved, and, and, and like, what, when you, even, like, the context, context of, like, things you say in your house, right, when you have kids. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. We're, we're very blessed in that the three boys, and, and I have another son that's not involved in the business. My brother has a, a daughter that's not involved. But the three sons that are involved in the business, like the business, they get along well, and they each have different disciplines. They My, always get along well? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> we, uh, as a matter of fact, speaking of that, my brother and I had, and this was, our wives were around, had a knockdown drag out fight. Not physically, but throwing hats, slamming doors, all those things. Went on for about 10 minutes. And uh, that night we were supposed to go out to dinner, and my wife said, we're still going to go to dinner? I said, yeah. So we went to dinner, and our wives said, How'd you do that? <laughs> it, was, it was business. We got it over with, and then we went on. You know, we're, we're, we're fortunate it works that way. Our, our three sons do. Our, our oldest son, my oldest son, loves to run the field. He schedules work. He deals with the uh, uh, owners and things like that. My youngest son is excellent at estimating and dealing and pricing and buying. And my, my brother's son 
takes care of the equipment shop and uh, repairs and buying new equipment. So they all have their own area that they like. And so they stay out of each other's way, really, yeah. and complement each other. And they all, fortunately, get along quite well. So let's talk about and part of that is due to Chris's input. <laughs> so let's say. yeah let's let's talk about that. So not about me, but about well we could talk about me. No. <laughs> um, so I was introduced to you guys a few years ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, about three years ago. And so I mean, I go back to that without getting into too much personal stuff, but you know, you and your brother at this business moving on to the next generation, and you guys were just also trying to figure out like how are we going to do this. Right, like how how are you going to handle mm -hmm. your retirement? Like you had an idea of what you wanted, right? What, did, what was your vision of what you wanted for yourself? Start there. Well, I struggle with that. I yeah. I knew we had to retire because the boys were getting older. It was time time to us for, to move back and let them right. go. So you maybe waited a little down, bit. So yeah, so we waited. A little bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. still waiting a little. Bit. I'm still yeah. in transition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we have a plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about it. He's so, got a solid plan. So some of the some of the problems we had that uh, we work with is uh, on a personal level. My oldest son uh, went through a divorce about ten years ago, and he's he's one of those people. He can walk up to anybody in the world and talk to them, make them smile, and get along. He is just outward and you know a lovable guy. Well, when we were starting to make this transition, he wasn't in that place. He was. He was not happy. It affected his work. And when my brother and I looked at making the transition, we said, are we going to have to build a structure around him to take care of that or what? And fortunately, we were in, introduced to Chris and Chris came in and did his individual analysis. Therapist. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. And believe me, I'm not a, I was never a uh, really big into shrinks or therapists or anything like that, but Chris or consultants. Uh, consultants. Consultants. Yep. Yeah, I've seen seriously. Some, I've them. seen some serious damage done by yep. companies that we know by consultants that telling them what to do and it was completely wrong. Yeah, I remember when I came in and your brother was like, "We don't need you telling us what to do." I'm like, "Okay, well, we won't do that, right?" And he was like, and he's like, "You know, kids coming into business and just you know mess it up," and I'm like. All right, well, we won't do that, you know? So, it's okay, man. So, yeah. So, Chris worked with my son uh, and with all of us and built trust. Uh, the Dow family is not a, not great communicators. Can you believe that? You guys don't have families like that, right? No. My wife will tell you, I come home from work and she says, What, what happened today? Nah, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> not much. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's, you know, the five of us are pretty much in the same. Yeah, uh, but Chris did break down some of the barriers. We did actually uh, work, uh, learn to to communicate a little bit better, to be yeah. vulnerable, truly, uh, yeah. which we're not. We're tough construction guys. We don't show our feelings or anything like that. Uh, so we did like five minute but, hugs, right? Well, <laughs> we, we haven't got to the hugging yet. That yeah. probably is not going to happen. <laughs> but. <laughs> But we have said a lot of things in meetings that we never would have said to each other. That's right. And it, it's been a great thing. Uh, and so the biggest thing to me is our son was given back to us. Mm -hmm. He's he's back to himself. He learned confidence. He learned, uh, he just realigned how his thinking was. And and it eased the way for my brother, who my, my that son is taking over his job. And my brother said, there's no way, you know, I'm not letting go of this because it, and now my brother has stepped back and, uh, and Todd, my oldest son has taken off and he's doing a great, great job and it's, it's been wonderful. Yeah. So, and Mark, Mark doesn't even have any concerns about it at all. No, not any longer. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's rewarding for me to be working. That's part of the reason I ended up getting into this, uh, type of work and it found me, but is that, you know, how many lives you can affect, right? And think about that, even as you're sitting here um, thinking about, you know, yourself and your business, that business translates, he said, you know, have up to 100 employees at a time. Think about all those lives that are yeah. that are impacted. And don't don't tell me, like one of the things we did when we did interviews is like, don't think that the people who work for you, and if you're looking at a transition down the road, I mean, you can see 
uh, Mike doesn't look older, but they can tell, you know, okay. um, you know, they, they knew the point is like, they know that the owners are aging out, right? Like they know, like, and then they see, oh, what's going to, you know, what kind of leader is so-and-so going to be? And then what's going to happen here? What's going to happen to culture? What's going to happen? And I think to tell someone it's not going to change is a bunch of BS because change is going to happen. So why would you lie to them anyway? So, hey, we're going to have some change, but it's going to be good. And this is why, right? Like be truthful. And the other side of it is, is that if you don't communicate, we talked about this earlier on, right? If you don't communicate where you're going and what's going on with the transition, you just do it, lock, lock closed doors and don't say nothing. Guess what they'll do? They'll fill in the gaps for you. They'll fill in the gaps for you. And do you think when they fill in the, think about the two motivators, do you think when they fill in the gaps, it's going to be a good story? No, they're going to talk about all the crap that's going to go wrong. They're going to talk about all the issues, right? They're going to bring out the laundry and they're going to bring out the baggage. And so, I don't know. And then they might start looking in the market. Maybe they're going to go somewhere else. Cause like I think anyone's going through transition, you're concerned about you know, how to retain my top talent. If that person's aligned because everybody wants to be what safe. Don't think that someone in your business isn't thinking about themselves and how this transition and what's going on in the future is not going to impact them personally and professionally. You'd be kidding yourself. Right. So what did you learn from? I mean, what if you're going to give, so let's talk a little bit about some takeaways here is, you know, why don't you talk about where we're at in the transition right now and don't, and he's, he's still involved with the business. <laughs> yes. Right. And he comes oh, yeah. in, even oh, when we have a meeting, he comes in when he wants to. <laughs> so um, tell, tell, tell him about what, what you did last, last few weeks, what you bought this spring, kind of what your life looks like now. Right. Yeah. Uh, to begin with, I, it, it was, it's been difficult me, for me to back out of it. And my brother too. My brother three years ago says, I'm going to work forever. He said we're going to carry him up by the feet first, I think is exactly. what he said. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, He's getting a little bit older and a uh, few more aches and pains and can't do the things he used to. Now he's starting to come around and I'm coming around to him. But it's difficult after working all this time. So uh, what we did is we said, and I think it does accomplish a couple of things, is we backed out gradually. And, you know, over the past three years, I've backed away from estimating and things like that. So my son is talking to all those clients and everything. It will be, they won't even miss me when I'm gone. Uh, same thing with our vendors, our, our employees, they know I'm there, but I have less interaction with them. So we've transitioned. My brother's doing the same thing. Uh, I wanted to, again, for the same reason, back out gradually. Uh, I know my wife doesn't want to see me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, we love each other, but not that much. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's worked out. We, uh, you know, you talk about what we've done uh, lately. Uh, my wife and I like to travel. We like the arts, so we want to do some volunteering and arts and things like that. We're involved in a, an organ hall in Methuen uh, that we are trustees and so we will do more work there. But we like to travel, which is one of the things. We bought a motorhome, so we've been able to take a couple of weeks off that I never would have taken off before, and we went out to Michigan to Chris's stomping grounds. And we flew back home and stay. We worked and did some things around home, saw the family, and then we flew out back out with my grandson, and we went another two weeks on the, on the motorhome. So it's a gradual uh, transition, and I'm feeling much more comfortable about it. And I think my brother sees that, and he says, "You know, I'd like to build some more hot rods and build a barn to put the hot rods in." So you know, he's uh, right. he's in the on. Board with that. And and you're not really tied to uh, you know operations right now. Like you know you're you're you're, you're doing uh, you're helping with projects, helping overview contracts, and and so he's being used very intentionally, but not necessarily tied to a place where you know if unless it's something critical on a given day, you know if you decide you don't want to come in, you know you could right. you could feasibly right. say I'm not going to come in, and I'm like okay, you know it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a big deal, or when the business is not going to be it's not going to be affected you know and, and everyone and everyone's happy about the scenario right and everyone feels feels really good about it so um if you let me share let me ask you one other question and then we're going to go to uh q a is that cool okay. sure um like this is like one of those hindsight things like right like if knowing what you now know about the process and the experience mm -hmm. that you've had and for your own transition in relation to what you just you 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 know 
and someone who's been part of a family business for your whole life and you know what's happened from generation to generations that you've watched and then now with your your your, your you know your other family whatever if you were to communicate something to an audience what would you say what you know what's one thing that you wish you had known a while ago that would have potentially helped you with with what you went through is there anything like I'm, an hindsight? I'm, I'm going to answer it a little bit different. Question. Okay. All right. Something. You're allowed to do that, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Some of the takeaways from me yeah. and that I would offer to you be great. is do it. You know, don't say, well, you know, 10 years from now, I think I'll do it. Get involved in it. We met with Chris Tuesday, and he's, he's going to embarrass me because uh, I. I didn't embarrass you. You embarrassed yourself. I embarrassed myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, Monday night, I had some, oh, we met on Wednesday, whatever day it was. Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah. yeah. Monday night, I emailed him on some things, and I said, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning came, uh, and I got a call, at, and we meet at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 to 10. And uh, my son calls me at 8.30 and says, are you coming? I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I overslept, and I, <laughs> so I showed up at 8.40 for our 8 o'clock meeting. So yeah. I was quite embarrassed. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but so, yeah. yeah, that's right. But so, so the things I, I take away is is do it. During that meeting we had, we started talking about the next transition from our sons to where they're going. They aren't going to start actively right. doing things. We, we went, we worked with our attorneys, we worked with our you know, accountants, we work there for everybody. But they are going to start to do that now. But they are starting to think about those in, in those terms. The other thing, the big thing is I have somebody that's tasked with moving that ahead. Because we started it, we, we did it over probably a three year period, I think. Yeah. And in the family, you know, well, we've got to get this project done as, as far as the, the transition. The then we have a bid that's due tomorrow. So we can't do it. Tomorrow. We'll do it the next day. It goes yeah. on and on and on. You know, other things come in and you don't do the things. So yeah. we had one of our advisors took on a task for himself. He says, I'm going to move this ahead. So he would remind us, he would set yeah. up meetings, he did everything and it just kept moving. It didn't, didn't break speeds or anything like that, but it moved ahead. And that was important. Had we not done that, we probably still would be talking about some of the things we're talking about. And, and it would have been done more by default. Eventually, yeah, right? Yeah, not not intentionally been. designed as it had, yeah. right? So it's a, you know, it, it's been a great, great transition. We've had a lot of rough areas in it. Uh, we've had a few arguments and everything, and yeah. Uh, but but it's we've learned to communicate, and it's uh, I think the results are are showing forth and working pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to say before we go to Q and A? No. Okay. All right. Um, let's do some, uh, steal some questions. Um, you mentioned your wife a couple times and your brother's wife. I'm just curious as to whether they were part of your process at all, Chris, or if it was just through them. Are they involved in the business? Great question. Um, no, they're not. Um, and it depends, you know, um, on, on, from me, I mean, from my perspective, it really depends on, I, I oftentimes will work with the whole family. But it really just depends on the dynamics of the family itself and if it's going to be helpful or not. And I did talk to, I did talk to one of your wives one time. And I'm did trying you? to remember, I did. I'm trying to remember who it was and why. I think it was, I think it might have been yours um, and it, earlier on. And it's just to get, for me, it was to get perspective because she wasn't really involved. In, how, how were they involved in the decision making process out of curiosity? They're not involved in the decision, in the, in the, uh, in the business decisions at all. But of course, they're involved in right. the personal and with the, all the results of the decision. So, uh, no, we would talk amongst ourselves, but uh, they weren't brought in. We've, I shouldn't say this, but we've purposely kept wives out of the business because, uh, you know, for various reasons. Yeah, and that's and that's a personal thing, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. No, it doesn't. It's and some bizarre. and some and some businesses, it's not that way, and it's not that. It makes them, you know, like, oh, you know, women's, you know, rights. So it's yeah. like, there's nothing to do with that. It's just, 
you know, it, it's what works for them. If everyone's happy and it works for them, that's the important thing. And no one, how I look at it is, is anyone having any rights taken from them as a person? And is this misaligned with that person's values? Those are the things that I'm checking in on. If the answer is like, it's not misaligned with values, it's aligned with values, and it's not taking any rights away from somebody involved, then I think it's good. But if it does, then then it needs to be it needs to be addressed. Please don't send me nasty letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I think that's smart. <laughs> so I, um, I I know that some of this is a matter of time and communicating values, but uh, in your experience working with uh, with people, what's one of the sort of Biggest pieces you can give, uh, you know, uh, big, biggest pieces of advice you can give as far as um, being the person that is, you know, that is going to be moving up to a bigger leadership role. Sometimes, because it's, you know, especially in my situation and a lot of people's situation, it's uh, it's a position that, you know, is extremely important to the person who's created or who has been doing it and yeah. you know as I, I was saying we, we were talking earlier as you know as a child of that person and seeing as the business that i am going to be working in you know is also almost a child of that person how do you deal with taking over you know like taking over you know taking care of that brother and make sure you don't like you know, what, what, what's the way to keep yourself from feeling like you're going to kill your brother? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to, do you want to yeah. comment on that? Um, I, I think the biggest thing was communication. And we were, I was, we were just talking, I was sitting at one of the tables during the exercise. And my other son is a little bit gruff and, and uh, he kind of wanted to push the, the issue and he really riled up my brother and me too thinking, gee, he really wants to push us out of here. We, we'll be gone in three months with him. <laughs> you know, we talked it through, and that, that's his nature. And uh, But he did, he did by doing that, he brought up some conversations that we probably wouldn't have had. So I think you have to, you know, I think respectfully, and that was the problem there. It wasn't done respectfully, I don't think. But you have to say what you need to say. And I think uh, that worked in our position that uh, we were kind of dancing around on eggs for about a week, but we got over it. Talk to Can I just ask, do you always, uh, did you talk with your sons in the, with another, with a third party to observe, or did, do you have a lot of conversations with them? Both. We do, uh, we're a, a family business. We're run by the family. All our employees are considered family. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty tight organization. We meet every Wednesday night with, the five of us and all of our outside superintendents and everybody for a meeting. And then after that, the, the five of us meet and talk about the issues. So we're always talking. And but were you, even during the week, we still do that. And were you asking though also, um, did he have did he have someone facilitate? Yes. I guess yeah, so. yeah, we did. Um, I did some of that. Um, and I'll tell you one of the things that I'll do is, you know, as you go through Lencioni's work, um, the, this, the vulnerability. So there's some exercises related to that. And then um, it's trust ball from the third story. It's, it's brilliant. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, and then from there, it's it's also um, try, trying to look at really creating conflict. So I, what I'll do with a with a family member, if one on one or in in a room, depending, is I'll I'll put their shit on the table. Like whether they're really not saying to one another, I'm gonna put it right out there. Well, didn't you tell me blah, 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 blah? Because if we can't break that through, then we're just gonna go into artificial harmony, like everything's okay, I'm not gonna go there, he's not gonna change anyway, and we can't get this done. And then what? We're not gonna get there. And so that was a really good question, uh, both those questions. So a little deeper level, I mean, how do you do that? You get everyone, that's why stage one, you get everyone aligned on what's our values, where, where are we going and what's most important? If we, we have to own this paradigm, if we do what's best for the business, we can also do what's best for the family. And then I have to look through that frame no matter where I'm at because I have, as a human being, I'm wired to 
take care of myself. Self-preservation is our nature as human beings. In order to work as a team though, I've got to put self-preservation on the side and do what's best for the team first with the context that if I do that and a value alignment, that it's going to be best for what's me too. Does that, does that help? Yeah, sir, go ahead. Uh, with three sons involved in leading disparate parts of the company, how are you handling governance? And is one sort of growing into a, a more senior leadership CEO type role, or do you somehow have equal sharing with that? We, it really isn't a formal thing. There are three, uh, there will be three. We, as I say, we meet on every Wednesday night. If there's important decisions they've met, we've never taken, all the time I've been involved, we've never taken a vote on anything. We've talked it over, we've made some decisions. And I think that's three. That, that was one of the issues that we had was that my brother has one son, I have two sons. We wanted to make sure that at the end, they all had the same amount of shares. So that, you know, I wasn't giving my sons 25%, 25% new. So we did work out how we all, they all end up the same and they all have an equal voice. We don't really have a CEO. Probably my middle son is probably the most vocal and uh, leads the charge in most times. But, and this uh, is, and I wouldn't, uh, just to overlay that, and I wouldn't, you know, think of this is context. So I wouldn't say that's best for everybody, right? In some cases it's not. If the reason that works for them is because of the dynamics of their family they have, you know, he said like we don't have to like have a, a quorum or a consensus, but they do if there's when we've worked through this, so, like there's certain things that come up, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, and like it's a big piece of equipment you can spend a bunch of money on, you guys are all gonna meet on it. Right. But there's another thing like I can, you know, Frank can just sign off on or talk and they, they can just they don't have to they don't even have to call in, right? They just they, you know, you just get it done. And but they have an agreement, right? Like, okay, if it's this kind of thing, then we're gonna get on it. And then they're gonna get in the room and then they're all gonna be heard. And they, they pretty much allow the person who's running that department to own the decision in nine out of 10 times, right? They let, right. Like, and even though if they disagree, they respect that that person has that and that, that that's gonna, we're, gonna, we're all gonna go that way. I think that's one thing to understand, all, anybody in the organization is, I had a CEO one time uh, said to me, I met with this guy and, uh, he said, uh, all right, well, okay, so I'm thinking about working with you and blah, 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 and, and my, my executive team, and but what we're going to do is I'm going to meet with them, and then we're going to, I don't make any decisions unless I have full consensus. I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, no, and if 100% of us doesn't agree, then we're not going to work with you. I'm like, oh, buddy. I'm like, I said, you, you can do what you want to do. I said, but I, I have a responsibility to share my perspective on this. And, and maybe he'll, and I thought maybe well, I might just blow him out and he won't work with me. But I'm like, that's a big mistake. That's a, I said, that's a critical problem. And he's like, well, that I get by. And I said, no, you get a bunch of BS because somebody's going to disagree. And then they're gonna, but they're not gonna want to hold into the consensus thing because they're not gonna win. They're gonna basically sooner or later they're just gonna give up and they're gonna go to artificial harmony and they're not gonna create conflict. And it's it's I said it's it's there's no way, right? A business a, a leader makes Bill Belichick needs to make a call, and you may or may not agree with it. They better when they get in the field and they call a play, you better be committed to run that play. Even if you disagreed holistically. I mean, right? That's how it works. Well, in business, you know, it really, should, you know, my philosophy anyway, it should be the same. And well, that's the, kind of why yep. I was asking. So I have four sisters, three of us are involved in the business. I'm more in the more senior role currently. That could, of course, change, but I'm pretty adamant about what you said, Chris. Is that yep. if, if you're going to be asking me to leave this, I need to be able to make decisions. Of that's course, right. we're going to do it collectively and take input, et cetera. But I, I will not sign up for it if we're in a situation where it could be me feeling one way and those two feeling differently and you know me not being able to decide how I feel best. So that's why I think it's yeah. You you really you have this the three guys who get along great. What if two of them want to sell the company and one doesn't? What's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, that's why they're equal. If you know they they can vote, and if it's two thirds vote, then. 
that's the way it is. Where right now we do, we do often will discuss something and and compromise, or you know, I might tell my, I might tell my brother, you know, we're not in a cash position to buy this piece of equipment now if we don't need it. Maybe a great deal, but we can't, so we don't. But uh, you know, it's and it works for us. I certainly believe that it wouldn't work in a lot of places. So. That's right. In some places, it doesn't work. In fact. Probably, from my experience, a majority of it doesn't. You need one person at the helm making the decisions, and that's typically it. And really, quite frankly, naturally, it might happen in this case. And with the three people, it probably ha I think naturally, because what I, I've seen, you know, as we continue forward, but I, I know I'm looking for this. Someone's going to kind of like, you know, what you can just handle this, this, and this. I don't really care, you know, that 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 realm uh, could happen. But I can tell you some of the partnerships I've run into are a 50-50 scenario. Oh. And you know some of these people, man, this is the biggest mistake I ever made was get into this 50-50 scenario, and I'm the CEO, and then I can't make a decision. And the other guy, the value was the values weren't aligned, or the bit and, and the visions weren't aligned. Oh, what a mess! What a flipping mess! It's, and it's a complicated problem to solve. Yeah. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, have you, in your experiences, or what you assume your experience will be? Um, in terms of transition, has it been harder to start or end the transition? How do you define start and end? Like, so you try to start the start of transitioning ownership versus being completely out. Okay. For who? Uh, the person going out. I have an answer. Depends on the person. Well, of course. But yeah. I mean, <laughs> What do you see a lot, I guess, is my question. Well, I think, I think the hardest, and Mike can uh, comment here, I think the hardest part is getting started. Because if you do it effectively through a process, then you're going to create what you want. And then think of the next part, you're going to have to go into the realm of like, what am I really scared of? And how do I, how do I overcome this? Because if you're going to create fear, it's a very simple uh, formula. You get on your timeline, you go out to the future, and you think how this is really going to get messed up, right? And then you paint a pic, you paint a movie, maybe it's 3D, right? <laughs> and then you just look at that movie and you go, oh, I don't want to live that movie. And then so you avoid it, put your head in the sand, right? In some cases. So if you can if you can start facing and overcome that, like. And I think part of the other issue with a transition for someone who's founded a company, and I've heard this a few times in here, is I have an identity tied to this business. That's part of my significance as a human being. The most powerful two words in the human language are I am. <laughs> I am and how we self-identify, which is all illusionary, if you will, but we live it as a reality. And if we can't, like Mike's like, well, who am I going to be? Or how am I going to have significance if I don't show up at the office? Am I where am I contributing? It's like he's got, you mentioned, he mentioned some, you know, uh, charitable organizations, things like that. So he can take his purpose, which was with the company, and then tie that purpose back into something in his vision going forward, which is something that I'm looking always to do. Because if I don't, you're not going to be fulfilled in retirement or wherever you're going next. You're stuck. So fulfillment is a is a you know significance is really important for us as human beings. We need to satisfy that need. We have to contribute somewhere, somehow, some way. We've done it through our business. If we're not going to be part of our business, we, we need to find an outlet somewhere else, right? What do you hear about people that retire and do nothing? They die, they die quick. They do. My grandfather just passed away at um, 99. I mean, and and uh, and he was uh, 98 last year, still driving his car. Living at home, he played tennis into his 80s. But he, he, when he, when he was retiring, he, he immediately spun up an LLC and started. You know, he loved being outside. He started buying and selling real estate and land. And even today, like he was, he was, he was doing it like a few months ago from the nursing home. He did, you know, he was, he was executing on a on a, uh, a an agreement on a piece of property him and his partner sold. No, I'm not kidding. I'm serious. But he loved it. What's wrong with it? He didn't do it because he had to do it. He loved it. He dug it, you know, and he was able to create, actually, he was able to create income all throughout his whole, his whole you know, he didn't have to, but he had a core, he had a core, he had a, he, there's, a, there's a core of him, right? Like his purpose was tied to that. 
So it just is really flipping happy. So like, why wouldn't you? Right? That answer your question? To help you quite help it? We can, talk, we can talk more. Let, let me just say quickly, for us, we knew we wanted to do it, so it was easy to get into it. But again, as Chris said, there's the fear of getting it and getting the momentum going. You know, I said, you know, how are we going to do this? Where are we going to start? And that's why I met, jump into it, get started somehow. And as I say, yeah. we were surrounded with some very good advisors, and uh, that really made a difference for us going forward. And uh, we'll have time for the one on one QA if you want to ask me something else, too. I'm happy to give perspective. Yeah. Like you mentioned, there was a bit of a different view on growth between mm -hmm. the generations. And I think that's a common uh, difference between generations. How'd you deal with it? Uh, we, our, our history has been fairly slow, steady growth. Not, not, we don't want to go like this and then down. We've seen too many people do that. So uh, when my sons got involved in estimating, they wanted to do bigger and bigger jobs. We kind of curtailed that when they, when they were over what we felt we could do. Uh, but we also let them go into bigger jobs. And as a result, we've grown from uh, oh, 20 years ago, we got a $200,000 job that we thought was fantastic right after my father died. Now we're doing $35 million worth of work. And that's, that's because we've allowed them to build, but it's still slow and steady and controlled financially. And uh, so uh, we kind of, they pushed and we, kept it down to what we felt was a risk tolerable level and uh, it's worked quite well. There's an underlying, um, that's something I, I wanted to bring up earlier, but it's probably good to bring it up now. A big part of the work through this process of any type of transition is owning the idea of letting go. Because eventually, you got it, and then the next generation in five years decides, and Mike and, and Mark are out. Do they want to change how they grow? It's their it's their company to do what they want to, and Mike might have his opinion with them or whatever and share it, but he's kind of decided to give them authority, right? Like at some point, like you know, he's got to let let it, like, hey, you know, it's because you're not going to be here forever anyway, and you want to support them. It's not we want to speak your your, your piece, but. And that's a tough, that's a tough one for folks. I mean, that's when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with the founders and CEOs. Um, there's a, it's tough to, it's tough to let go. It's like, how is your kid letting go? Like it's, it's, uh, it's, there's some, I mean, even a mourning process that can happen. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I have a story about that. Okay, go. <laughs> I mentioned it at the table I was sitting at my youngest son, he's a bit of a character. So he says to my mother and I, he says, don't worry about your retirement. He says, I got it all squared away. I got a brand new cardboard box and a place under the bridge for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at that point, I decided I don't want to go on the haphazard route. I want to plan my own. So was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty evident that that was the better way to go. Get <laughs> a question over here. How long have your sons been working with you in the business? Uh, over 20 years. And they've grown through from working in the trenches all the way up. And my sons, I made work for somebody else before they got into the business. So they had another outlook, Smart. another look at. Smart. Yeah. But Smart. They've, they've grown right up with it. And that was oh. a good move. Other than Chris and your experiences with him, you've mentioned working with other advisors in this transitionary period. Yeah. You, you don't like me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just all for using people whose expertise is yeah. above my own. You're talking about than. financial we, advisor, right? We have, we have a very close relationship with our accountant. We're actually very close friends, have become so. Uh, he advises not only on financial, but he's good at networking with people. Uh, he's been intimately involved with this process with us because he knows more about us than we do sometimes. Uh, we also had a financial advisor, uh, Jeff, who came, uh, he actually sells insurance and uh, some other things. He's very insightful and empathetic. And as a matter of fact, it's through Jeff. Uh, Jeff, wanted, Jeff is the one that actually 
said ta tax himself with moving this forward for us because that was part of his deal and he actually t got us in touch with with uh chris when we said we have this problem and he understood we had the problem uh so those are the the two big ones oh, we also learned uh, uh, and of course an attorney uh, we have a number of attorneys but we work with attorney that does uh this accession and stocks and things of that nature and then we also in a minor way worked with our uh with our bonding company because what our transition really affects their relationship with us and they want to feel comfortable that the next generation is going to be able to to do the work that we do and with our banks you know, so those are the accountants of banks and a bonding company uh are really people we stay in touch with and are quite close with how important is it that the people you're working with that those organizations that your, <laughs> your your values as a family and a business are aligned with theirs oh extremely important extremely important yeah because pay attention to that it's because someone recommends somebody yeah. interview yeah. them Right. To me, a bank is built on personal uh, things. We, we've gone through a number of takeovers in banks. And fortunately, we've had the vision to always not just deal with one bank, but we deal with the second or third bank in a small way. So we build a relationship. And then when our bank was taken over and we lost all contact with anybody we know and we're a number, we had a transition into a, a bank that we already knew people had a thing. So. Uh, that, that's been kind of a thing that's worked well for us. We're doing that now. We have a bank that I know we were bought out. Uh, we have a, a, a good advisor. He's stuck with us and he's done pretty well. Once he leaves, I know that relationship's going to change. So we have uh, one other main bank and another one we do a little bit with so for transitions. So we're big into transitions. <laughs> <laughs> that help? Yeah, no, I, we, I, I recently started working with my the first generation and the accountant and our insurance guy and the lawyer are people I call weekly. So I just wanted to make sure that I know. I think it's missing. very important that you get somebody you really feel, really feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Our previous attorney who was a partner with our new attorney, I didn't feel comfortable about talking with him about things. Well, can we do this? Can we do that? Uh, not because we're trying to do anything illegal, but you say, can, can we tweak it this way? Can we, our current uh, accountant, I can say anything to him. And they say, no, nah, you'll probably go to jail for that. Don't do that. No. <laughs> but that relationship is so important. Yeah. So. We're good on questions. Do you want to, okay. um, do you want me to wrap up? Yeah, go I to you. We should do is we'll, we'll wrap up. Hopefully you're still recording. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gone um, to sleep. And then we're going <laughs> okay. to, I have, I'm going to take the surveys around. You guys again, love your feedback. I'll get your business cards. If you don't have it, you can use name tags and put it in because I've got the three books to give away. And then you guys are going to stick around for a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. So here's what we'll do. Uh, let me just kind of close out here um, and then don't move. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully this is insightful and helpful. Yes, uh, I think we'll hang out for a little bit. Um, I think it'd be um, intentional. Uh, you can come, you know, ask if you have one-on-one -on -one questions you want to ask or to any of us, feel free to do that. Um, also, uh, out of respect to your organization, uh, I typically hand out uh, cards to check a box uh, if you want to have a conversation. I'm not doing that, but I just will let you know if like, hey, you're like, hey, I'd like to just I have a question, a burning desire, a question on something you presented. Uh, it's not, if you give me information, we won't contact you and hammer the hell out of you on selling you. Um, but make sure you get uh, your information to Erin right here at this table, and she'll make sure uh, we, we get contact with you for the, and we can help in any way. Um, I find by just offering some, some time, and Justin would do the same, just to give someone some insight, even if you never uh, work with us down the road, uh, it's, it's part of our core value to give, and so that it just comes back to you anyway. So that's, that's how, we, how we show up. Um, Anything else? Uh, think, thinks that's it. Do you have any other parting comments? Well, only, you know, I, Chris is probably more pointed to, but if you have any questions of me, please uh, contact through Aaron. I'd be glad to talk to anybody about our, sure. our experience, which, as Chris has said, wouldn't necessarily be yours, but, you know, yeah. I'd be glad to talk about Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, offering the time, and thank you for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for coming out. Um, I appreciate it. So I think the last thing I'll say is that Go back to decisions, 
why we're, we're, we're talking about decisions, decisions we make, we're talking about transition, whatever the transition means to you. Um, and remember that you can do it by place of responsibility and intention, or you can do it, you know, by choice or by chance, right? Really, really decisions yours. So uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate thank you. it. Oh, we just, yeah, you can stop. We ended up on time.